Uh, this, this panel is on uh, the, uh, the on online video and its implications, uh, and in particular, several different several different aspects of it. So, as most as most of you know, um, online video uh, is growing very quickly. Uh, it's uh, probably the most bandwidth-intensive use of the internet for at least millions of uh, typical uh, internet re residential internet users. Uh, and as we heard from uh, Chris probably this morning, its growth really shows no signs of, of slowing down. Um, and it has, uh, has far-reaching implications onto you know, several aspects of, uh, of, of the internet and the way we see video. So it has, uh, it, it has implications on the economics of uh, both core and uh, last mile infrastructure uh, in, in that it uh, both, it may be accelerating the increase in data traffic uh, it may be creating uh, changes in peak times or the, the, the size of the peaks uh, that infrastructure has to deal with. Um, in addition, it, uh, it, changes the way, it may begin to change the way that households watch video. We've traditionally been, you know, seen video, bought videos in bundles, bundled packages from video distributors, cable companies, satellite companies in particular. Uh, it could have implications on that. Uh, it changes, it can change um, who directly might be paying for content and the implications for how new content is funded, uh, what types of content is profitable. Uh, and these are, you know, early days for online video and we don't, we really don't know how it's all going to develop, but, but we're beginning to see uh, these changes. And so this panel will discuss some of the, some of the implications of them. So uh, we have a, a great panel here to discuss them and I, they're seated um, in sort of random order because as a W I don't like to put people in alphabetical order because I feel we've been long discriminated against. Um, <laughs> when I'm on a panel I like to have people whose names only begin with W or after. Um, so, but uh, our, our first speaker will be, um, will be Mark Israel, who's um, the Senior Vice President of Compass Lexicon um, and has done lots of work on antitrust uh, and his expertise in econometrics, industrial organization. He was also um, in, my, uh, in my PhD class at, at Stanford. Um, and that's, that's right. <laughs> uh, and uh, and, and we, we all admired his ability to, to find uh, giant data sets that uh, everyone else thought were secret um, and uh, <laughs> turn them into uh, American Economic Review papers. Uh, still trying to figure that one, figure that one out. Um, and then, uh, then we have, uh, we have uh, John Ryan, who's the uh, Chief Legal Officer for Level 3 um, Communications, uh, and will be able to tell us not just about the, the core um, you know, uh, brought backbone providers in the U.S., but also around, around the world where they have, um, where they have networks. Um, and we have Paul Dessa, who's currently uh, Chief of the Office of Strategic Planning uh, uh, and Policies at FCC, uh, where he's been since uh, 2009. Before that, he was a partner at, uh, at McKinsey, where he was a leader in the uh, telecom media, private equity, and corporate finance uh, practice. Um, and finally, we have uh, Kyle Dixon, who is uh, Vice President of Public Policy for, for Time Warner. Not Time Warner Cable, Time Warner. Um, it, it, <laughs> which makes a big difference in this, in this context, of course. Yeah. Um, so, all right, so I'd like to, we're not gonna do opening statements, but I'd like to start um, with, uh, with Mark. If you could give us sort of a, an economic overview of, um, you know, an economic overview of, of peering and settlement and uh, you know, what you think the, how, how the economics are changing today and what the challenges are uh, going forward. Okay, thanks, Scott. Um, nothing like a small question to start with. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll just, I'll run through this pretty quickly. I'm sure there are many people in the room um, have more expertise than I do in sort of the, the history of, of internet transit and peering and internet, um, you know, transport in general and internet backbone services. It's an area that I've sort of thought about in some sense at a personal interest and in some work uh, as an economist. Um, so just to make, I mean, most people know the basic background, but just to set the stage to make sure we're on the same page, you know, sort of, as we know, the internet grows out of a, a history. It always sort of depresses me to talk about the, the olden days of the internet and realize they were when Scott and I were in graduate school together. It's, it's kind of like when I go into the gap now with my kids and realize the clothes we wore in college are now retro. But, but, uh, but um, you know, the early days, a very hierarchical sort of structure where there were end users who, you know, contracted, had services from ISPs, ISPs, you know, gen generally um, contracted with backbone providers who provided, who, who, who made up the, the, back, the base of the internet. Um, fairly simple structure. From an economic point of view, not surprisingly, the, the sort of contractual structure that went with that was, was also pretty straightforward and simple. Um, so you had, um, 
you know, users contracting with ISPs, generally ISPs buying transit services from backbone providers who would get them access to the entire internet, and then backbone providers generally peering with one another to exchange traffic with each other, um, generally on a, on a settle, or usually on a settlement-free basis, they would just exchange traffic back and forth. Um, as I said, from an economic point of view, it's less about the technology than there was this, you know, a nice contractual structure that seemed to work the way things existed at the time. Um, as, as I see it, as an economist, there's really sort of been two changes that have most fundamentally caused that structure to get more complicated and the set of contracts and relationships between firms um, to, become also, to become similarly complicated. One is obviously that the topic of this panel um, video, or more generally, just the explosion of the amount of content going back and forth. Uh, we'll get more into it without, you know, getting deeply into it there. That's just led, you know, to, to big increases in infrastructure costs um, that have that, that need to be funded. I also, it's also, I think, led to just a, you know, an explosion of different users who get value from the internet. Uh, and a topic that, you know, is of interest to me is just you know, the ex even when we talk about internet video, the extreme heterogeneity in terms of who the people providing or using video are, right? So very naturally, when we talk about internet video, it ranges from sort of YouTube type uses up to you know, Netflix and HBO and Comcast and other providers who have major presences. Um, and so I think an interesting question is sort of what's, you know, is the structure of contracts working and how is the marketplace dealing with those heterogene heterogeneity of users? Uh, and they're the, the extremely different types and amounts of value they get from the internet is, is one challenge for these contracts. Um, but just dealing with that explosion of content obviously has put strains on the traditional methods. I think to this point, you know, the contracts that have evolved and are continuing to evolve in the marketplace is working, but obviously that's an, an, a time, an open issue that we're in. Um, the, the second big change I think that goes with that is really just the the, the, and really one more directly related to the changes in transit and peering type relationships, is just that the, the firms, the individuals and firms involved in the internet have become much more complex and multidimensional in terms of what role they play, right? So historically it was these distinctions between say tier one and tier two internet providers were quite clear. Today it's very hard to see where the lines stop um, if you think about firms like, you know, a firm like Comcast or a firm like AT&T or firms, I mean, they're really involved in providing content and in ISP services and in backbone services. So they, they sort of need transit and peering relationships, but they also serve as ISPs and they provide content. Um, you know, you think about a firm like Google, um, maybe Hal can help me under, but, you know, I, I defy anyone to, you know, sort of where does Google fit into this whole relationship? Where does CDNs fit? Um, so those changes, I think what they've really led to are, you know, as m many of us know, more complicated contract, con from an e economic point of view, more complicated contracts that reflect those complications. So you have people who are traditionally buying transit who now directly peer with one another, what you might call secondary peering, sort of people going around the traditional backbone providers to peer directly. Sometimes that peering is settlement free, sometimes there are payments involved. Um, as if you have, you know, you have, you have sort of this partial network of peering, and then there are some partial transit relationships to go with it. So I might peer with many people, but then provide transit just to cover the rest of the internet. So this sort of nexus of contracts has become much more complicated and, and I think is continuing to evolve. Um, and I'll just sort of, as far as, to me, the two fascinating questions for the future are, um, I think it comes down to two things. One is obviously the explosion of video leads to huge demands on the on the internet and on the backbone and huge investment needs, you know, you know, lots of cost, but also enormous value that people are deriving. So the question, but it's, it's obviously going to lead to, you know, issues of congestion and, you know, issues of intense traffic users contributing more to congestion and peak times. So questions about, you know, will, how will pricing evolve to deal with that sort of congestion, you know, sort of who will pay and how will they pay in order to, I think as an economist, it seems efficient that people will pay based on sort of the value they get from the internet and, and, and not, you know, the, there will be congestion-based elements and usage-based elements in pricing over time, but sort of how does that work out in contracts? Who pays, you know, which side of the market pays for that, I think is a, is a question going forward the market has to deal with. Uh, and the second one closely related is just this multi-sided na nature of the market. It's really a bunch of contracts 
to make use of this common platform. And so sort of who's going to pay and, and what side of the market is, and how, we, how are the contracts going to work out to deal with end users and ISPs and content providers and, and sort of who, which side of the market is going to end up paying, um, taking into account this disparate value and, and, the, and the demands people put on the network. So I think those, you know, those contracts have evolved from the very simple early ones to a richer set that, that I think are working pretty well, but lots of open questions about how, how that pricing and how those contracts evolve uh, over time. Thanks. Um, so, uh, John, you all have obviously been in the, the thick of these uh, increasingly complex contracts. Um, tell us a little bit about um, whether you think that the, 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 sort of the, the existing system of of these um, bilateral contracts uh, is working or not working now? What's sort of what's changed that's making it more difficult? And um, you know, do you see sort of conf the types of conflicts we've seen becoming uh, more common in the future, or are we sort of going to be able to work beyond that? I, I think unfortunately the conflicts are going to become more common. Um, to to uh, Mark's point, we, we have uh, existing peering agreements with large. Um, suppliers where terabits of traffic are exchanged. Those agreements were drafted in 1998 and they're on month to month terms right now, right? Cancelable by either party on 30 days notice. Uh, the tools that existed in 1998 to 2002 to uh, the understanding that businesses had about what the consequences were of interconnecting two networks uh, and exchanging traffic uh, blunt instruments. I mean, they are not sophisticated. They don't reflect uh, the information that's available today. Uh, and I do think that there needs to be a push towards more intelligent interconnection structures uh, within the internet. Uh, we're going to lead that push. Um, we're uh, anxious to get to terms and conditions for the exchange of internet traffic that are fair equitable, non-discriminatory, don't place burdens inappropriately on one of the parties to the uh, traffic exchange. And the good news is the tools for understanding how those burdens should be allocated have gotten far more sophisticated than they were even five years ago. So uh, there, there is hope, I think, to take some of those uh, very rudimentary contracts. I mean, I, I did some of them in 1998. So the truth is, I know that once I saw month to month, my brain turned off. Uh, and um, there, there's, I like to say that peering is one of those things that at the time network engineers didn't understand it. Sometimes they interconnected the network without even having a contract and the traffic was exchanged for five years with nothing written down. Um, but the truth is about those peering links is it's like marriage. It's a lot easier to do it than to undo it. <laughs> and so those agreements that um, are now developing into next generation agreements are more about subscriber experience and customer service. Y you need to think about it like a prenup so that you uh, start to think through, okay, what are the what ifs that can happen during the course of this agreement? What if the traffic flows change? What if there's a new application that suddenly means that instead of subscribers receiving a ton of content, subscribers are now sending a ton of content? If, if we've learned anything over 10 years, it's that um, making predictions about the future of uh, internet usage, uh, those predictions are going to be wrong. Now, I will make one prediction that I have a high degree of certainty on uh, that's germane to the subject of our, um, of our panel. And I, I very rarely get to make predictions that I really feel confident are true. The future of internet video that comes from a source that's affiliated with your ISP is extremely bright. That video will be cached uh, or stored on a CDN server that's really close to your house. And as a result, that video will be delivered with higher uh, quality, 
with uh, better performance characteristics uh, than the video that you're currently receiving. The future of internet video that comes from sources that are not affiliated with your ISP, eh, I don't know. So, um, so with these contracts becoming much, or they, you say they, they should be more um, sophisticated because there's, it, it's so much more complicated now than it used to be. Um, are these things that you think can be uh, just worked out between companies, or is there going to be a role for, for the government? I mean, is, is it the case that this will be the last policy conference that we discuss this at, and it'll move to sort of engineering conferences, um, or uh, you know, are DC people going to be involved in this? I think that there's a role for government to play in uh, protecting competition. I, I mean, if you look at what has driven um, internet video to the point where it is today, assuming you're satisfied with the progress that we've made to date and you say, what have been the drivers to get us to where we are today and how do we make sure that those drivers continue to operate in the future, I'd say the single most important factor in delivering to you right now the video that you can get on Netflix, MLB.com, NFL, streaming, cached, whatever it is, the single most important characteristic that's led to that is competition. Uh, and it's not just, uh, it's, it's been robust, bare knuckle, cutthroat competition. Um, five years ago, six years ago, it would not be possible for uh, an entity to enter into a business where it contemplated delivering feature-length, high-definition videos over the internet. Uh, ten years ago, the price per megabit for that transit service that Mark mentioned was above $100 a meg, and in many instances, multiple hundred dollars per meg. Right now, it's sub-10. That price decline over the past decade has enabled the delivery of video over the internet. You can, draw, you can draw a curve in Netflix's business model and say, how much does it cost to ship videos over the mail? And at what point in time does the cost curve for delivering over the internet cross? And it was around 2007. Um, so uh, I would say the one area that government needs to be uh, concerned about is assuring that that competitive environment flourishes. And uh, anybody who's familiar with the 1996 Act or the history of telecommunications will say the one area where um, competition is, has been most threatened is interconnection. This is a supply chain that brings you a video from a source to your eyeball. Uh, if there's not robust competition at, at as many levels of that supply chain as you can, as you can get, the prices will go up, the quality will go down, uh, and we won't be satisfied with where we end up. So are you shorting Netflix? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I hope not. Uh, so, um, Paul, uh, so, so of course you're going to tell us exactly what the FCC is going to do. Um, I mean, so far the FCC basically really hasn't done, done much of anything. It's been, at least for the Level 3 Comcast dispute, which we're not going to go into directly, it was sort of a war of letters, right, um, that sort of piled up the FCC. Um, it, but has the FCC started looking at uh, these types of interconnection arrangements uh, and, and thought about uh, whether or what the future role for government might be here? Um, well, so, so I should say, particularly with two commissioners in the audience, and I can only speak for myself, <laughs> not, not, for the, not for the commission. Um, but I think, you know, just to build on what Mark and John have said, I mean, this is a, 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 a part of the internet space that's basically been privately controlled, right? There have been private contract negotiations. Generally, uh, uh, I think when there's been some engineering problem, the engineers have called each other up and figured it out between them. There hasn't really been a need for government. And to sort of Commissioner McDowell's point yesterday, if there's no sort of clear problem to fix, it's not clear why, you know, anyone would intervene. That being said, obviously, things are changing. Uh, as Mark said, the, the increase of traffic from video, the increased asymmetry uh, due to video traffic, the changing nature of the industry structure as last mile networks get into the backbone, as backbone guys get into CDNs, things are getting more complicated and people are coming to us, I think, more and more often, like in the level three Comcast dispute uh, uh, and in other things, to say, hey, FCC, you guys should intervene, you should be paying attention. And I think uh, uh, there's a few models that people have in their heads when they come to us. You know, one is, the continuing status quo, the hope that notwithstanding the changes in the industry, the kind of private uh, uh, way of making sure the peering continues to work will continue going forward. 
Another, I think people have uh, uh, a little bit of the kind of model that happens when cable and content guys negotiate, right, which is basically private contracts. Sometimes there's a bit of a blackout. Things get solved pretty quickly. The FCC technically has some sort of cop on the beat role, but doesn't really intervene uh, formally. And then there are people, I think, who want some sort of more formal intervention, more on the sort of old interconnect kind of 96 act type model. Uh, I think for us at the moment, not really seeing a problem. No, I'm not asking. No, 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 I, I, no, no, of course. But, but, some people, but some people do. There are some sure. people running around who do that. Um, so I think for us, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that we're smart on the issue. So we're uh, using opportunities like Level 3 Comcast dispute to sort of gather facts. We're very fortunate at the moment. We have a chief technologist, uh, Doug Sicker, who's a professor here at Colorado, who's been in this space for 20 years, uh, has been you know, very helpful in educating us on on it, um, you know, we go to NANOG, the engineers conference, and other things to make sure we're, we're getting smart. Mostly so that, you know, we know a what to keep an eye on, and b when people come to us and complain whether they're just trying to drag us into private contractual disputes or whether you know there really is a larger problem here. Um, I, I want, before we move on to content, um, even though content is king, let's, uh, or maybe it is, or maybe it's before we move on to that, I want to come back a little bit um, and, and to talk about uh, maybe. Uh, try to be a little more specific about uh, what sort of markets we're talking about when you say that, I mean, when you, uh, John, when you talk about wanting to preserve competition, and Mark, you sort of talked about the problem of even defining the markets, I guess. Uh, so, uh, John, what, how, how, would you, how would you define an interconnection market? What, is, what does competition mean here? What should we be looking for? And then, uh, Mark, I'd like to hear the... Well, I, I, I actually um, believe that the market that where competition needs to be preserved is in the transit marketplace. Um, th that is the tool, you know, if, if somebody like Time Warner, for example, wants to, ha has a bunch of content that it wants to get to subscribers within the internet, um, it will, it has multiple options uh, to do so. Uh, and I, I say transit, but it's actually broader than that uh, because the, the functions that we're talking about are how can an entity that has content uh, connect to the networks that need to deliver that content to the eyeballs. Right now, there's a number of different options available. There's a transit marketplace, which in the U.S. includes anywhere from 15 to 20 uh, uh, providers of transit services that, op that operate on a nationwide basis. There's additional competitors that operate on regional bases uh, where they, you know, they may be able to offer you an interconnection location in uh, New York, but they don't have the capability to go to, you know, they have the capability to take the traffic to a Los Angeles, but they don't have an interconnection point in Los Angeles. They may buy services from other transit providers. So w when I think about the level of competition that needs to be preserved, it's, it's largely that market where um, what we have seen is rapid uh, expansion of supply and rapid decline in price uh, and rapid improvement in quality. I mean, those ought to be things that we should stand up and wave our flag about uh, and say, we are really proud of that market. Now, what are the threats to that market? Well, there, there is one conceivable threat to that market, which is in the absence of uh, allowing that market to interconnect to, just as an example, a single entity that has 22% of the broadband subscribers in the United States, <laughs> if that uh, interconnection is not fair and equitable, then there's a risk that the entity that controls the eyeballs can infect competition in the backbone. Uh, and they can do that by saying, you know, uh, if, you go, if you go with level three, level three is going to have to pay me to get access to your eyeballs. Why don't you just come straight to me? Uh, and I'll charge you slightly less. Uh, what happens at that point is that robust 15 to 20 entity competition becomes constrained. Uh, and that's what I worry about. Mark. Um, I mean, I guess, in, I mean, I agree with much of that. Um, I find it, I mean, as somebody who generally does antitrust issues for most of my living, I actually find it, would find it very difficult if your question was precisely how do we define an antitrust market here in the context of, say, the merger guidelines. So I'm, I'm going to dodge that question. Um, I mean, That's I, my it, next question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be careful what I say. Um, I mean, it's clear to me that, I mean, I think about this economically as a platform that delivers content of all sorts, not just video, but content of all sorts. Um, from content pr 
producers, some of which are large companies, some of which are individuals, to people who want to consume that content and related applications. Um, I agree entirely that sort of remarkable thing about the internet marketplace and the nature of contracts has been how well competition has worked to, to date um, and has sort of how the chaos of the early internet has evolved into a well-functioning on the whole marketplace. Um, I think that, um, and I guess I don't, I mean, I generally agree that, you know, I mean, I agree with competition policy in general, and you want to make sure that no one, you know, no one is sort of, in an anti-competitive way, ex exercising undue leverage over that marketplace. I guess I'm less certain that, um, than John about the, I'm even more uncertain about my predictions. Uh, I'm less certain that it's the ISPs as they exist that, that exercise that leverage um, as a, I mean, just given continual evolutions in, ter in, in ways to distribute content, um, you know, via cable or telco or satellite or mobile. Um, I guess it's less clear to me at this point in time sort of who has the, the power there or whether there are, will be little bits of power or potential leverage from certain types of content um, or from certain device producers. I, I guess it's not, I, I agree that we ought to be making sure there's a, a, a marketplace to deliver the content that, it, that allows people to, you know, to, to innovate and to, um, and to continue to compete for that. I guess it's not, I'm not as convinced that the issue is necessarily with ISPs. I, I guess to me the number one lesson to date has been that there are, there have been sort of short-lived, or the history of the internet, there have been sort of short-lived periods of time when some particular player seemed like the dominant game in town. That's usually been quite short-lived, and, and, and in my view, a sort of economic returns from that short-lived profitability have driven a lot of investment. So, so to me, things still, still seem pretty robust competitively. Uh, I certainly agree we want to make sure competition stays that way. I, I guess to me, I'm a little more optimistic that the number of players involved and the number of technologies involved, many of which we've heard about here, are continuing to do that. Um, I, I think that's a, uh, talking about the, the, different, uh, the different types of players is a good place to go into uh, content, which is obviously a big, a big player. And before we go to Kyle, um, I want to ask Paul. Uh, Paul, you gave, you gave a talk at uh, Silicon Flatirons. Um, sometime in the last year, I guess, on this one. And the best, one of the best parts of that talk was that you cited The Onion, um, which I think is always the makings of a good talk. Um, <laughs> that's, that's where we get but, all our policy ideas from. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, but you, know, you thought a lot about, uh, about the, the, the implications of the transitions to, uh, uh, to you know, digital music, uh, online music, and, um, and, and books, for example. Is video different than those? Um, you know, I think the thing that, that we were discussing at, at Flatirons was if you, if you look at various other types of content markets, so whether it's books or music uh, or newspapers even, there seem to be sort of three common threads that have happened, and then there's a question about how does video stand against those three threads. So, you know, one thread, I think, is um, kind of the separation of the, the content from the stuff. So, you know, you want your music, you don't want a thousand CDs lying around. You want your books, but you don't want necessarily five bookshelves full of things that, that fall on the floor. And so one is the sort of that, that uh, separation, and particularly then when people's business models are often geared more around the stuff, or at least a large part of the business model is around the stuff. So think about a newspaper, how much of the business model there is around the printing and the distribution and the retail of the newspaper as opposed to the actual newsroom itself. So one question is then, just by definition, as the sort of the physical part of it goes away, how do you adapt your business model? Can you adapt your business model quickly enough to sort of keep up with the demand? Um, you know, the, sec the second trend, I think, was around uh, uh, bundling and editorial uh, uh, functions. So the kind of album, you know, turning into more the a la carte music. So instead of needing someone to play the sort of bundling role and put the different songs together, going more to an a la carte model. Similarly for you know, newspapers putting together the classified advertisements with the news, that being separated with things like Craigslist. Again, another challenge to business models that are more geared towards that bundling role. And then the third piece, uh, uh, as things move online, the opportunity for new platform business models that didn't really exist. So something like uh, uh, the Kindle as a platform for books doesn't really exist in the old world. Uh, uh, you know, something like iTunes as a platform for music doesn't really exist in the world of albums. Uh, and so I think if you tick through those three trends for video, I mean, so first the, the dematerialization piece, the separation of the physical, you know, probably not such an issue in the sense that most content companies are used to delivering uh, uh, just the bits, as it were, uh, 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 
via TV, via the cinema. You know, the one exception to that possibly is uh, uh, DVD sales, I think, for most movies, about 40% of the total revenue ends up being from in-home sales, you know, videos, then DVDs, and, as that, and that you see that clearly going away and declining and being something of a challenge to the economics of some of the studios. Uh, in terms of the editorial role, um, you know, I think it's one of the challenges for content companies uh, uh, is managing or trying to stop a shift towards a la carte. Clearly, the economics for most content companies of moving into more of an a la carte model uh, uh, for their channels as opposed to more of a bundle model are negative. Uh, uh, and so whether they can either manage the transition or hold that transition off or make it economically neutral to positive, I think is a challenge for video. Um, and then in terms of the new platforms, I think in video, you, clearly the content guys have been watching what's happened to uh, uh, other types of information. And so you see things like TV Everywhere and Hulu efforts by the content companies to be that neutral platform versus something like Netflix, which is you know, more of an analogy where someone tries to come in with an attacker platform model. And I think that's an open question, right? With, with TV Everywhere, let's see how that goes. With Hulu potentially being up for sale at the moment, let's see you know, who ends up bidding for that. Uh, uh, and Netflix, you know, certainly growing like crazy, uh, but probably moving now towards a, a international for growth rather than domestic. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Kyle, uh, so they say, I mean, the, 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 the cliche, the content is king. Um, if that's true, um, how are you going to extract all the profits from uh, Level 3 and the cable companies? No, I'm just kidding. That's not the question. Um, Asking the, nicely, the, I, I don't know. What, no, the, what are those profits? <laughs> the profits? Good point. Um, no, the, uh, so in, in, uh, Wall Street analysts talk about, uh, they, they say that um, uh, content you know, should, needs to worry about changing analog dollars into digital dimes or digital pennies. Um, that, as uh, Paul mentioned, that people don't seem to be, you know, the willingness to pay for lots of content online is, is, is fairly low when they buy it a la carte, except for sort of a few, a few things. Um, what, what is Time Warner's um, sort of overall strategy for dealing with online, uh, online video? Um, you've spent, you know, we've worked a lot in uh, combination uh, with uh, video distributors, traditional tri video distributors, uh, and so how does, how does online fit into, into uh, into your strategies? Sure. Well, um, you know, first of all, we don't have any crystal ball for all the reasons that Paul and others have laid out. Um, the market is incredibly dynamic, um, and, and we're clearly trying to respond to, to that dynamism. On the one hand, it's undeniable that consumers really do want to have more flexibility in terms of how they uh, consume their content and where they consume their content, and that's why companies like ours uh, have been running around trying to meet that consumer demand, uh, selling uh, some of our product to Netflix, uh, engaging in ongoing discussions with all manner of uh, distributors, including Apple and Amazon, um, as well as uh, engaging in a lot of uh, initiatives ourselves. Um, a lot of you may be familiar with our HBO Go product, which uh, by which we put the full library of HBO content uh, online and uh, available through video uh, tablet applications, as well as uh, streaming of some of our Warner Brothers movies movies through Facebook, uh, et cetera, and also uh, through our acquisition of Flickster, um, engaging in more uh, sort of social networking type functions, trying to uh, make use of the, the fan uh, based generation that can occur. Um, but at the same time, um, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that it's undeniable that consumers still see uh, value in the uh, uh, very diverse array of programming that they're currently getting, uh, programming that's highly uh, uh, produced uh, and indeed just expensive uh, news and entertainment um, at home and over and over their favorite uh, favorite devices um, some of the ways we know that are you know advertising over broadcast and cable remains uh, pretty healthy uh, we still haven't seen a significant drop off in terms of uh, cord cutting or, or uh, our consumers unsubscribing to cable service despite despite uh, uh, slow growth in factors such as uh, homes occupied in the US, uh, as well as the fact that the cable programming business continues to, to be strong, uh, even for premium channels like HBO, our HBO, I like to say, um, uh, that for which consumers have to pay extra. And, and um, you know, anecdotally, at least, uh, cable uh, uh, content makers are, are thinking about new ways to actually invest in more original programming, which is the most expensive type of programming. So uh, again, I don't have a, a crystal ball, 
but I, I think what we should always come back to, and I think this is relevant to the infrastructure discussion as well, is the overall health of the internet ecosystem, which in, in our view really uh, turns on uh, uh, an environment that creates and sustains long-term consumer value. Um, and we think that that uh, situation or that environment is best created uh, if uh, content creators, uh, video service providers, um, and other companies can continue to bargain with each other and with consumers for mutual benefit. Uh, of course, absent any sort of uh, abuse of market power or other things that would undermine consumer welfare. Um, so, so that's how we think of this issue. But again, we don't have a, a magic formula. Uh, the only things that we can do in a dynamic environment is uh, preserve our flexibility to respond to changes in consumer demand uh, and technology uh, and make sure we keep an eye on the long term. Um, I mean, so you know, just the, the challenge um, for, well, for, for both uh, companies like Level 3 and, and video distributors and cable companies is how to make sure that they can fund uh, investments in their infrastructure with these changes. The same, as you're saying, is, is true for content companies. How do you continue to fund new content, which is expensive? Um, with, with, for, so for example, with HBO Go, um, that seems like one of the few types of products that consumers have already been conditioned to pay for almost a la carte, because they have to buy it as a premium product on top of their cable subscription. Um, does, uh, it seems like if there were a place to start selling something direct to consumers, it's something like that. Um, does that does that enter into your into your thoughts about um, how to maximize revenues? I mean, I know this isn't th this is the business side, but yeah, are you asking me for a prediction of what we will do with HBO Go in the future? Um, a prediction that has to be accurate. Yeah. Okay, good. No, no, no. But, um, but, uh, I'm I'm about to leave the room. Um, <laughs> no. Um, I, but but where, I mean, in, in general, HBO Go. How does that? You know, what does that mean? What does that say about your sort of your overall strategy? Um, I, I think what it means is that we 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 have learned the lessons of. Uh, uh, the music industry and, 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 and we see the competitive dynamics. We know that consumers want flexibility. And, and we also know that um, you know, we need to respond to that um, because if the trains left the station, we you know, can't catch up. I'm really bad with metaphors today, so just <laughs> forgive me. But in any event, my, my overall point is we want to nurture an environment where we continue to experiment with things like this. But we also, as content creators, we have any number of distribution mechanisms, uh, traditional mechanisms, which as I just mentioned, uh, continue to be robust with uh, broadcast and cable, uh, online, uh, video applications for our movies, et cetera. We have to look at all of those things and try to maximize profits over that entire range of, of distribution mechanisms. So um, you know, we don't look at uh, anything as a one size fits all. In fact, you know, every piece of, uh, every film, every television program we create is unique and has different economic characteristics and different demand characteristics. And so therefore, we can't have some one size fits all approach to how we will distribute that content. I mean, that sounds totally right. I mean, I, I would remember at a high level, just back to sort of the industry numbers. I mean, I think the cable industry altogether pays about $17 billion for content to serve 58 million consumers, right? I mean, Netflix pays about 1 billion to serve 25 million. So to the extent that, you know, one guy cuts off the cable subscription to go to Netflix plus broadcast, that's a massive, you know, 17 times less, you know, per user con to the content companies. So it's not clear that it's really in their interest to, and I'm not saying it's good or bad, but just as an observation, it's not clear that it's, you know, managing that transition is clearly something, you know, that they have to do carefully. So, I mean, not with your FCC hat on, but with your analyst hat on, um, if, if they can't sort of manage this transition, as you're saying, um, what would the future, what would video delivery look like? Um, and what sort of, and how would that affect what types of new content get um, uh, developed? Well, in terms of the content development, I think maybe, maybe it's, it's more to Kyle's uh, uh, area of expertise. I mean, I would say, look, you know, I, I agree with what Kyle said, which is I don't think anyone is predicting massive cord cutting, right? I mean, even the most aggressive forecasts, say, by 2016 or 17, you know, only about half the households in the U.S. will have TVs that can connect to the internet directly or via a, a, a video console or via, you know, an Apple box or something like that. And probably you'll only see at most five or so percent cord cutting. Mm -hmm. So to some extent, I think it's a bit of a, a moot question in that, you know, I, I, it seems almost inconceivable that you will see a lot of cord cutting and therefore the economics of the content business changing 
changing dramatically. I mean, if anything, it's probably upside, right? So, I mean, you think about the challenge of moving from the bundled sort of cable model or, or MVPD model to more of an a la carte model, that's sort of the risk. On the opportunity side, as, as Kyle said, I mean, you have you know, more channels fundamentally that you're playing off against each other in terms of their content costs. You have uh, uh, the opportunity like, you know, the CBS Amazon deal for 2,000 TV shows, you know, to monetize that for, uh, you know, a few hundred or tens of millions of dollars that's basically free money. You have the chance, I think, to piggyback as things like Netflix go overseas to Latin America and Europe, uh, a chance to piggyback on those as a way to monetize content that you probably wouldn't have been able to monetize other way internationally. So there's, there's you know, I mean, my personal opinion is that for the content guys, there's a lot of opportunity as long as this sort of, you know, massive cord cutting doesn't materialize, and it seems pretty unlikely that that will happen. So, I mean, so we've been just been talking about the U.S., and you did mention um, other, other countries. So, John, um, I mean, as working at a, a company that operates networks around the world. Um, is, is the U.S. different somehow? I mean, we, have, we, we know we have more video streaming um, than most other countries so far with, with Netflix and Hulu, but how, what have you observed in, in other countries in terms of uh, the changes in, these, in these, these data flows and the kinds of uh, challenges that you're dealing with? Yeah, the, the, the U.S. is not remarkably different from at least um, most of Europe, uh, including um, to a it may not be as true in Eastern Europe, but certainly in Western Europe, uh, things are very similar. Um, based on what we know, South America seems like it's, you know, back up the uh, clock, maybe four years. It's at that it's at that inflection point that the United States was four years ago. But the but the traffic flows and the asymmetry are um, the same. The internet, you know. Uh, 10 years ago was a tool where uh, most subscribers sent about the same amount of traffic that they received, uh, and the uses of the internet were the, the, the traffic flows, the direction that traffic was flowing um, was symmetrical, or you know, if it was out of balance, it was uh, only slightly out of balance in terms of uh, traffic flow symmetry. Now what you're seeing with the uh, advent of video is uh, in, the, in, in the internet, what people call uh, asymmetric traffic flows, which means that you as a subscriber send a little teeny bit uh, that requests you know, a very large file coming back. And the truth is the, the way that traditional peering uh, worked in the internet, what it used was hot potato routing. And what that means is literally drop the drop the packet as soon as you can to the other party. Uh, and if you have these asymmetric traffic flows combined with hot potato routing, then you do get to um, inequitable arrangements between it. So if you can think you about just it. just define hot potato routing quickly in case there? Sure, it's, it, so uh, it's um, when, when, when uh, a Comcast subscriber for, a, let, let's assume we're, I'm paired with AT&T. An AT&T subscriber requests a movie. It's a very small little bit, uh, and that subscriber is sitting in New York. Uh, we have an interconnection location, appearing location with AT&T in New York. Hot potato routing means AT&T drops that little teeny request uh, at the first interconnection that they can possibly do. So it comes to us uh, in New York. Uh, we look at that packet and we say, that requires content that might be stored on our CDN servers, or in the worst case scenario, let's just use the example of just true transit, uh, that content happens to be stored on a, a server that we have in Los Angeles. So we carry that little teeny bit all the way across uh, the United States, and we go and get the big file. You know, it's a little envelope with an anvil coming back. Uh, and if you use hot potato routing, uh, we have another interconnection location in uh, Los Angeles. So we go pick up that, uh, con that big anvil and we hand it to AT&T in Los Angeles and say, good luck getting this to your subscriber, uh, have fun. So that, that's why I say the, these arrangements were built for an internet that um, existed 10 years ago and you do need to rethink them uh, because in that instance, level three is carrying a little teeny packet uh, across the United States, and AT&T ends up carrying the anvil. Um, so from our perspective, 
we need to rethink those things and say, how do we get to a point in time where neither party is uh, gaming that interconnection in a way that uh, creates advantages for it? The backbone costs are not inconsequential uh, as traffic continues to flow. And that same dynamic exists in Europe. Uh, exactly the same sort of peering arrangements existed, exactly the same sort of, you know, uh, the, the, the industry has been focusing on these traffic imbalances. The traffic imbalances by themselves don't matter. It, my cost doesn't differ if I'm carrying a large packet from New York to Los Angeles or Los Angeles to New York. The direction doesn't matter. What matters is the size of the file and the distance I'm carrying it. Um, we'll go to questions in a, in a minute. So if you have some, uh, you know, get, uh, we, we'll call on you in just a second. But I, I, um, I put Kyle on the, on the spot unfairly a minute ago, so John would like to do the same. Uh, so you, um, you, I mean, you, you mentioned uh, initially that uh, the, the, you know, the very quickly falling costs of transit, um, and obviously, uh, you know, as a business matter, that's you know kind of bad for you. Um, over time, it has been, right? Um, depends. It depends on how much demand grows. No, that's true. That's right. Uh, but, and, and so now you're also talking about the, um, you know, the, the challenges of dealing with uh, the, the changing nature of, of demand, but it also must be an opportunity, right? I mean, you know, there must be a reason why you wanted uh, Netflix traffic. Sure. Um, and so how, do, you, do you see, your, do you see your, your basic business model changing? I mean, do you think that in five years people won't think of level three as primarily a, a tier one that may not even be the right framework anymore? But I, I, as, as Mark was saying, I'm not even sure I can define what a tier one backbone yeah. uh, is anymore. Uh, but the, the short answer is yes. I, I mean, I think you've seen us make some acquisitions over the course of the past couple of years that have led us more deeply into the bid markets space. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think you'll continue to see us try to get more mid-markets customers on our network. Uh, we, we're in a mode where uh, the payback on local network extensions, in other words, putting things on net to the extent that we can, is exceedingly good. Uh, so if we can start generating cash to continually expand that network, that's good for us. Fundamentally, that doesn't change our business. Our, our business is about moving bits. And if you look at the, um, the um, website that we developed, and it, frankly, it hasn't changed in, uh, in 1997, the, the, the fundamental premise that the company was founded on was silicon economics, which is uh, our way of saying uh, bandwidth is price elastic. If you lower the price, demand will go up. Now, that's good. Uh, it, it was great for us, uh, you know, and AOL kind of set the table by uh, introducing all-you-can-eat uh, pricing from a subscriber perspective and training a bunch of subscribers to expect uh, all-you-can-eat uh, buffets, and then that's the model that got adopted by the cable companies and by the ILEX as they rolled out DSL. Well, now, surprise, surprise, You've set up an all-you-can-eat buffet, and the Denver Broncos show up time and time again. People want your service, and they want more of it. I, I, I have trouble, though, generating a lot of sympathy for that, because even when the Denver Broncos show up to the all-you-can-eat buffet, uh, the, the retail ISPs seem to be making a fair amount of money. So uh, I'm not sure that... Uh, you know, it's great for us, and that's what we would like to see continue. All-you-can-eat buffets where you guys consume as much as you possibly can, and our hope is that the price declines uh, don't outpace the demand increase. Now, they have in, in some instances in the past, and that's why I say it's been cutthroat competition, but at some point as you approach zero, uh, the decline slows down. Um. Well, it's just the Denver Broncos. <laughs> um, so, uh, do we have questions? Um, yeah, we have to wait for a microphone. Uh, hi, Mark I'm Erickson with uh, <clears throat> Hulk and Erickson. John, I have a question for you. At one point, you said to preserve competition of the 15 or 20 different transit providers, that interconnection has to be fair between the transit provider and the and the ISP. How would you define what's fair? 
And if you feel that it's not a fair arrangement, what's the remedy? Including, is, is there a remedy at the FCC, or is it antitrust, or is it just all business negotiations? Yeah, uh, well, right now it's all business negotiations. Um, we have a belief which is, um, if we're willing to bear the bulk of the backbone expense associated with getting the content to a regional doorstep of an ISP whose subscribers want to see that content, that there ought to be no access charge regime for access to those eyeballs. Fundamentally, that's, that's the issue. There, uh, in terms of uh, what is fair and equitable, the, the, you know, the bucket that, uh, of business practices or potential negotiated outcomes that I would look at and say, that seems fair, is pretty big. Um, and there are a variety of toggles that uh, you can adjust to make sure that it's fair on an ongoing basis. What, what we're looking for, and, and fair and equitable is one measure, it also has to be reliable uh, and it has to be scalable on a moving forward basis. And, and that means that the business people and the engineers for both parties are going to be talking to each other far more frequently than they have in the past. They already are because traffic's growing, right? Uh, and the, the, the one area where, um, that I worry about is artificially creating congestion that effectively rations the bandwidth to the subscriber. Uh, and um, that's fundamentally what concerns me the most. So those agreements need to address triggers for augmenting the interconnection points. Uh, they need to address triggers for changing the location of interconnection points to the extent that traffic warrants it. If, if I'm willing as a network operator to say, rather than hand you the traffic in Chicago that's destined for your subscribers in Springfield, I'm willing to take it all the way to your doorstep in Springfield and hand it to you there, that um, that sort of structure ought to be captured. Whether the FCC has a role or DOJ has a role in making sure that that works, I think is open-ended. I think if you look at the network neutrality order, you'll see that the commission has um, taken a step back from um, having any hands on those interconnection arrangements. And part of me looks at the neutrality order and says, well, if you, if you don't cover congestion with respect to interconnection, or, or peering links, it's kind of like having a speed limit that doesn't apply to cars. Um, because fundamentally, that interconnection link and congestion in the interconnection link, is that's where the rubber meets the road in terms of how you see your content. And you know, so, usually when we talk about con uh, congestion, um, I mean, in, the, in this context, uh, or in these kinds of discussions, we're usually talking about just last mile. But obviously, you've got, you're concerned with um, other, I mean, do, do you experience congestion in your network at particular times? Uh, sure. It, it, usually it's in circumstances where there's been a fiber cut, so half a ring has come out. Okay. Uh, and, <laughs> you know, you, you, you do reroute uh, along the back half of that ring, and if that happens to happen during a natural disaster or a Super Bowl or, you know, something um, that's consuming a lot of content, then you will see congestion. Um, the, the difference between the service quality provided by any one of those 15 to 20 transit providers, frankly, is the measure of congestion that they're willing to accept. Uh, our engineers are willing to accept uh, very little congestion. So we tend to augment uh, backbone links when peak utilization reaches relatively low percentages. I won't share those right. publicly, but, it, but it's not, you know, we're not waiting for it to hit 80 or 90 percent at peak uh, because the traffic is too unpredictable uh, to wait that long. You will congest if you wait too long. Mark. I mean, I just wanted to respond to the question a bit. It's always a struggle for me as an economist because I don't think economists have any idea what fair means. So uh, it's, it's always a struggle. We don't really do fair. Yeah, we're jerks. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, we understand economically efficient and, and sort of caught, I mean, looking for ways that interconnection can happen in a way that's efficient and cost minimizing. 
And I, and I guess the, the way I think about it is, I mean, the, I think the lesson to, to date has been while there's been some frictions, generally, you know, con there's been evolution of the contracts and the nature of interconnection that has certainly driven down the cost dramatically. So my, although I agree in, in robust competition policy, my concern about an FCC role, I'm gonna leave this to, Paul, but I mean about too much of one is just, you know, you wanna make sure you're never in a situation where there's prescription to the point where two parties could have a contractual agreement that would minimize the total cost and be more efficient that would somehow be not allowable under a regulation that couldn't see that coming. I agree with that. And, and the, the concern would be, you know, when two parties can get together and negotiate and pay each other back and forth, they can develop an incentive to minimize total cost. And sometimes regulation can sort of force them to take one, you know, to not fully internalize all of that. That, that just the comment, my concern would be just finding the line between, you know, having rules that are specific enough that they don't create regulatory uncertainty, which can be hard on investment, but not so specific that they eliminate the ability to sign efficient contracts. It seems to me why Paul's job is hard. But. Um, I think we could take uh, one more. Uh, yeah, right. Well, wait for the mic. I think it's it, just one more, right? Hi, uh, Caroline Holland with the Senate Antitrust Subcommittee. And this question is probably more for Paul and Kyle. Um, do you think the expansion of online video um, will be more of an HBO Go or TV Everywhere model, which requires a cable subscription, or do you think it'll be more towards the Netflix model, which is um, separate from a cable subscription? Um, Hulu is becoming a little bit of a hybrid. Um, and then a second part of that is, um, while you say you're not worried about cord cutters, are you worried about the young people who aren't cord cutting, but who aren't connecting a cord in the first place? I guess I'm first. Um, gosh, uh, I don't have a crystal ball in terms of you know, how things will play out in terms of uh, what the business will ultimately emphasize. As I said before, we're going to be looking at every distribution mechanism and trying to make the most of it. And that's why we, instead of just relying on traditional cable and broadcast, we really do try to innovate and invest in, in new ways of, of reaching consumers. Um, you know, I, I think um, you also, I think we need to think about sort of the long-term um, uh, future of the content that's created. I mean, one of the, the concerns that we have about sort of all-you-can-eat low-priced models is that they grew up at a time when the programming that was provided over uh, that portal was, uh, you know, has been sort of lower value, less attractive content. And uh, we need to ask ourselves as both companies and policymakers whether we want to create a world that sort of favors that model, which uh, could have the adverse uh, consequence of undermining investment and innovation in, in uh, high quality news and entertainment long term. So um, again, we're a company, we're going to keep uh, trying to, 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 to serve our customers and, and maximize profits and move with demand. But in terms of specifically where it'll end up, um, it could be that it could be uh, complementary products and services, uh, just like we're seeing now. We see different distribution mechanisms being complements to one another rather than replacements. Yeah, I, I mean, my sense is, you know, you start with the premise that it makes no sense for a content guy to undermine the fees from the cable company to go a la carte direct to consumer, right? For most content, even, you know, even the sort of the high value HBO content, which probably has the best chance of going a la carte and going direct to consumer or, you know, an ESPN, it still just doesn't make sense. I mean, the, 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 the you know, a bunch of the analysts, a bunch of the banks have looked at this and said, look, what's your maximum upside from, even if you sold it to Netflix and Amazon and direct to the consumer versus the loss of the affiliate fees, it's just, just not worth it. You know, that being said, that was probably true of uh, uh, music too, right? And somehow, that kind of collapsed and albums went away. And I think there's, so there is always a temptation, right? I mean, there is a temptation of sort of free money. There is a temptation to do one deal here and one deal there. There is a temptation if some guys are doing a deal then other people do it. And ultimately, you know, gradually you end up undermining sort of the golden goose to mix, mix, mix metaphors, right? And, and, and things, uh, things crumble. But I think, you know, as I said, that the content guys have been, it seems very smart and very aware of what's happened to other industries and really are trying to make things like authentication and TV everywhere uh, uh, the platform for the online content. Um, the ahead, only sorry. other thing I would, would add is just, um, it's not just sort of in the interest of content creators in terms of how this plays out. Um, we also need to be thinking about the overall benefit to the entire ecosystem. And one of the things that we do think about is we all benefit, you know, again, uh, Time Warner Inc. doesn't have any infrastructure. Uh, in terms of cable or broadcast, but we do care very deeply about the overall health of the ecosystem. And so 
um, we need to be concerned about whether we still have a situation, which we currently have, where wired and wireless networks continue to invest and innovate and compete to upgrade their networks to carry all the wonderful stuff that we create and that others create and user-generated content and the same thing. So um, I, I wouldn't just leave it in the category of uh, it's just what we're doing as content creators to make money, but we also think it's consistent with what's best overall for the internet ecosystem. And, and on your second question, I, I think you're right. I mean, I think the people see the sort of the, the cord nethers as, as more of a threat than the cord cutters, as it were. But again, you know, the household formation statistics tend to track with the general macro economy. You've seen, you know, household formation go down sort of uh, over the last few quarters, which has led to some sort of, you know, confusion about, you know, are people cord cutting or is it just you're getting fewer households formed? Uh, so I think, you know, even if you roll the numbers forward in terms of household formation and you assume some proportion of those will be called nevers, you know, people graduating from college who never had cable and don't see the need to start, you still don't get to, you know, a very high percentage of total households uh, without some sort of pay TV. Okay, I think with that we've got to move uh, right on to the next panel. So please join me in thanking the panelists for their very thoughtful, candid comments.